if there's one thing that I've learned, not just from Aristotle, but from music, from films, from reading literature, if you don't believe it, that's not a good thing. Like the biggest, the biggest fault that you could fall into as a writer is thinking that unbelievable is a good thing for your story. Unbelievable is not a good thing. Hello, fellow creative voyagers. This week on the Indie Author Podcast, I talk with Douglas Vigliotti about timeless storytelling principles, including the significance of consistency, reversals, and recognitions in novels, drawing parallels to mediums like film. Doug also explores the role of believability and logic in creating compelling stories and reflects on the impact of marketing pressures on current narratives. We also discuss the cyclical nature of transgressive art. And now let's hear from Douglas Vigliotti about timeless storytelling principles. Hello, and welcome to the Indie Author Podcast. Today, my guest is Doug Vigliotti. Hey, Doug, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. So to give our listeners and viewers a little bit of background on you, Douglas Vigliotti is the author of four books, including Aristotle for Novelists, which we're going to be talking about today, and Tom Collins, A Slightly Crooked Novel, which is available to listen to on Slightly Crooked, Good Stories Told Well, a podcast that also features his raw and unorthodox poem collection, Mini Heartbreaks or Little Poems About Life. He's also the host of Books for Men, a weekly podcast to inspire more men to read. And he lives in New Haven, Connecticut. We've been chatting about a fun place to see in New York before we got started recording. And so we're going to be talking about some of the topics in Aristotle for Novelists, 14 Timeless Principles of the Art of Story. But Doug, I had a question for you before we started, a completely unrelated question that I listened to some episodes of Books for Men which I very much enjoyed. They were like the little kind of bite-sized pieces of content to take away and think about, which is the reason that I also liked Aristotle for Novelists, which we'll be talking about. And I can kind of see how you might have been picking the books based on a male audience. And I guess maybe the the discussion was a little bit oriented toward uh, male listeners, but it was certainly, you know, I'm I'm a woman. I enjoyed listening to it. So I And then I also found out that you were in sales. So I have a branding question for you. <laughs> And why did you decide to brand your po- your podcast as Books for Men? That is a great question. So I do not think that I am capturing the biggest audience by branding it Books for Men. I think that I'm trying to scratch an itch that I believe exists in the marketplace. And that itch is a very practical one in that I believe a lot of men don't read. And that is observed through my lived experience. I could, if I get around a group of friends and there's 10 of them, it's, I'm lucky if one or two is reading a book. And if they are, the chances of them reading a piece of fiction is slim to none. And I think that there's an open secret in the publishing industry that men don't read. And there's some a lot of data, I think, that would confirm that more women are readers, at least of fiction, than men are. And so this is more a labor of love to say, hey, I'm a man. I read a wide variety of things, fiction, nonfiction, memoirs, literary fiction, crime fiction, biographies, essay collections. I mean, you name it. And I like these things. So maybe you will like them too. And so if I brand it as books for men, men might pop on, listen, and then say, hey, this is, oh, this is for me. Because for like in my own experience, when I read, (laughs) it's so funny. Sometimes I'm confronted with the question, do I really like this? <laughs> like, am I it, like you read something that you that necessarily will, you know, you necessarily wouldn't read, and then you have to ask yourself a rather funny question: In is this something that I actually like? And of course, like if I'm being honest, I'm like, yeah, I do. But it's just a funny question that, especially if you read widely, that I think um, you have to answer from time to time. Is that? I hope that answers your question. Yeah. I have a book called Podcasting for Authors, and one of the topics I talk about is uh, positioning one's podcast. And I oddly sort of have this combination positioning thing, which is I named it the indie author, but I don't 
address topics that are specific to indie indie writers, indie published writers. They could be uh, applicable to traditionally published authors as well, or you know, people who don't know what path they're following yet. And also, I bill it as addressing the writing craft and the publishing voyage. And so I can really talk about anything I want to in that space. But I do see the benefit of uh, niching down. But I, I like that idea that niching down on the brand, not niching down on the content, because you can obviously talk about any book you want to, which is nice for keeping your own interest in, in keeping that going. The other thing I will just mention, too, is I've hosted an interview podcast in the past and it was hard for me to maintain. So for me, the maintainability was a really important aspect to, to doing that show. So when I pivoted into Books for Men about two and a half, three years ago, I did it with something that would be, I don't want to say easy, but easy for me to maintain on a consistent basis because I'm sort of a believer in the idea of compounding and maintainability being the core ingredient of that. If you can't maintain it, you can't do it repetitively and you can't, it doesn't compound. And so to what you were saying, that breath allows me to, to do that, it gives me ease in that, in that regard. Yeah, it's so interesting because I can't imagine sustaining something where it was just me talking. This is such a personal decision. And even when I'm signed up to give a webinar on a topic and it's pre-recorded and, you know, I could just uh, do it whenever and send it off. I always ask for a host of the of the sponsoring organization to to be my audience because I just can't imagine just talking <laughs> to a camera for for that amount of time and not feeling like there's somebody on the other side. So it's so interesting. But I, I did really enjoy Books for Men, so I recommend it to everybody, whether you're a man or not. I appreciate that. Thank you. We're going to switch to our primary topic today, which is Aristotle for Novelists, 14 Timeless Principles on the Art of Story. And we've talked a little bit about the the why behind Books for Men. So why what was the why behind Aristotle for Novelists? Right. So this is a very good question. So again, you, you might be able to sense my creative impulses. To no, it was another itch that I wanted to scratch. <laughs> and that is... When I'm so I first when I first started writing about publicly anyway, I would say about nine to ten years ago, I started in the nonfiction space. And when I pivoted into fiction, which was around six or seven years ago, but uh, yeah, about six or seven years ago, one of the things that it became apparent to me was if I wanted to write novels, I was gonna have to learn how to tell a story. And when I look at writing fiction, you could break it up into two things. You could break it into story and you could break it into writing. And writing was never something that I really had a trouble with necessarily. I have sort of a penchant for being able to get words down on the page. But the story aspect was one that I admittedly didn't have much experience with. And so the farther I dove into that, what I realized was everything started funneling back to Aristotle. And specifically, I looked at filmmakers and theory on screenwriting and all of this started funneling back to Aristotle. And that's what led me to Aristotle and poetics. And since I've read it, I don't know, dozens of times, many translations, and six, seven years later, a few novels later, I was in between writing, coming off of a, a novel and I had the time and this was idea was in my head of why isn't aren't these principles in formatted for novelists? Because historically they're widely, widely used in a dramatic sense to tell stories for the pay, for the screen and the stage. And it just made no sense to me that there wasn't something specific to the novelist. And so that's how the book was really born was me getting I was me just wanting it to exist essentially. And then once I wrote it, I shared it with a couple of writer friends, varying points in their career. And it was pretty unanimous. They were like, you've got to put this out into the world. Like this could help so many people. And so I became inspired by that. And that was how I, I wrote it and then brought it out into the world. That's cool. I like this theme of finding the things that really kind of light you up and, and pursuing them in that way. So I looked through the 14 Timeless Principles, and some of them sounded familiar to me from other, uh, no doubt adopted by other 
instructors in novel writing. But there were a couple that that didn't sound familiar to me, and I wanted to talk about those. One was principle number two, which is novels should be consistent. What does that mean? (laughs) Right. So I think that if you're a novelist, you could confuse this sometimes with thinking that novels should be consistent every chapter. But in reality, it means when, once you've decided the style and structure, the characters, and how you're going to tell the story, it's important that you remain consistent throughout your novel in doing so. So in Poetics, Aristotle, he talks about what's called medium object and mode. Medium being the style and structure of your story, object being other characters in your story other than the protagonist, and the mode being what most novelists would think of as tense, point of view, and narration, right? And so it's really important that if you're starting with, if if you're telling a first person story and you're telling it in the present tense, you maintain consistency first person in present tense. Now, if there are novels that dictate a chapter to chapter change, depending if you have a perspective change, if you have different parts in the, in the book, I share examples of this with stories. Like I read a lot of literary fiction. So if you ever read Trust by Hernan Diaz, that, that book is told in four or five different parts with extremely different styles and extremely different structure and an extremely different structure to the story. But the one thing that is consistent is part to part, there is a level of consistency. So part one is consistent, part two is consistent, part three is consistent, although they are completely different from each other. And the other thing that really hits home for me with this consistency piece is even if you look at a writer who writes unorthodox or if they write not adhering to grammatical norms and their style is completely unique. The one thing that is that that makes their writing work is that it's consistent. So if it's consistently bucking the trend, it's consistently <laughs> it's funny. it consistency is the the ingredient that lies at the heart of good writing and good storytelling, really. It, and Aristotle is very, very persistent about this in the book, even with characters, he says, if a character is by their nature inconsistent, make them consistently inconsistent, right? And we see this all the time with unreliable narrators, right? Unreliable narrators are consistently inconsistent, but then they get that gets into a whole nother thing of, should we be trusting what the character says and thinks, or should we be trusting what they do? That That's what I mean by consistent. Yeah, I... I'm reading a book, I won't uh, mention the name, but I'm finding it jarring because from chapter to chapter, it will shift from a uh, third person to first person, which I'm fine with like all first person novels and all third person novels, but I am finding there at the beginning of every section, I always read a couple of sentences, then I realize I'm kind of in a different place with this book and I have to go back and, and reread and readjust my mind, which could have been very intentional on the point of the author. Maybe they wanted me to do that, but it is kind of a micro example of that consistency um, so admonition. The, here's, the, here's the thing for me anyway, is I have, with this book particularly, it's like I have no intention of telling a writer how to write their story, right? Like style to me is, I'm so passionate about it. I'm so, such an advocate for people who are doing things differently and unique and striving in, in, in that regard. But when you look at the story elements, something like consistency, you'll see it in every, if you open up every novel that you enjoy, you watch every television show you like, movie, that element of consistency is independent of style. It's something that is higher than style. It, it's, you are consistent with the style that you are doing. Yeah, And sometimes it's, it could be the choices that an author makes. They could be, could be jarring sometimes, but that, that, that's, that's, that's what makes this art so subjective and fun to to talk about and engage with. Well, I'm going to take us on a little tangent because your conversation about inconsistency, even if someone is bucking the trends, reminds me of one of the things you talked about on your podcast, which was 
I think it was an episode on Fight Club, and you were saying that it was from this era where there was much more sort of transgressive yes. bucking the trends work, and that that isn't really being, that kind of thing isn't being produced so much right now. I'd be just curious to hear you talk a little bit about that. <laughs> yes. I mean, I do think that that is the case. I, 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 I believe that, in my opinion, we're going through a time period where transgressive art really isn't in vogue. I don't necessarily think that that will remain it that way forever. I, I think that all art is cyclical. If you look at uh, the 70s, the 70s was a time period where there was a lot of art that pushed boundaries. And then in the 80s, things became a little bit more commercialized. In the 90s, brought in another wave of where there was a lot of boundary pushing into the tooth into the 2000s and then we got into like the 2010s where things again for a lot of cultural factors and a lot of um, technological factors play into this where things have been more certain narratives and certain we're try, trying to push certain certain things upon our stories that are not necessarily, and it kind of ties in, and I don't mean to kind of pivot out of that, but it kind of ties into exactly what Aristotle says in Poetics, because he says, writers are should not be bound to the same moral standards as other pe as people when they're writing their stories, meaning you have to tell the story that needs to be told, not the story that you are trying to force upon it. And when once you develop your characters, it's up to you to, to, to write them truly. And I think we're living through a time, in my opinion, where there is a lot of forced things happening in art because of external pressures. And it's not producing the best or most satisfying products many of the time in across the whole spectrum, music and film, uh, literature in general. Uh, but again, I don't think that this is, I do not think that this is like a stopping point where, okay, this is just the way it is. No, 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 no. It's, I think that it's going to cycle over because if you push stuff far enough one way, you have reaction against it. Life is cyclical in that way, at least yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, I do. Uh, this may or may not be what you're talking about, but it does make me sad when I read about writers who have been compelled to rework a book or parts of a book that maybe has been out for years, if not decades, to meet some current moral code. And I think a better solution would just be to read the book as a product of its era. You don't expect a, a book written in the 1850s to reflect the same social mores as we have now, but don't go back and fix it. Go back and read it as as a product of its time with all the caveats that go along with that. I think, and this is not in vogue to say, but I think that a, there's a lot of censorship that hides behind this is not commercially viable. Mm -hmm. So the idea of when people say this isn't commercially viable, it really is a way to censor what is really being said. Yeah. There, it's, it's, it's just the polite way to say this isn't commercially viable, meaning we don't want to share this message with the world. Right. More food for thought for our listeners. <laughs> Sorry, so, I, I can get very, I'm such a champion for unique boundary pushing art that I could I can get exhausting and cynical sometimes. And so I, I'm trying to avoid that. <laughs> We're not exhausting and cynical now. So I appreciate your approach and your perspective on that. Uh, I'm going to skip down to another one of the principles that uh, piqued my curiosity, which is novels are told through imitation of action. Yes. So this is, this is, every writer knows this, right? This is show, don't tell. And it gets into the whole idea of why storytelling began. And Aristotle believes that storytelling began because of two reasons, imitation and rhythm. And Imitation being, that's how we learn to live. We, we learn to live by watching people do things and then we imitate them. 
We learn to speak that way. We learn to cook that way. We learn to crawl that way. We, you watch somebody do it, you see it, and then you do it yourself and you were imitators. And so stories should be imitation of action. And this gets back to what I was saying moments ago when I was saying the, that reliable, that unreliable narrator who were paying so much attention to the way that they speak. But really what we should be doing is watching what they do because what they do ultimately doesn't line up with their words at some point. And we're like, oh, we should have known the whole time because it's the action that proves the character, not what they say or think. And novelists specifically could get into trouble with this because so much of the form is, could be thought or internal monologue or dialogue, but it's really what is the character doing that's going to prove who they are, right? So Aristotle has this, this quote where it's, character is a byproduct of action. That's what tragedy is about. And he says tragedy because poetics is written about tragedies and epics, comedies. It was never, that was a lost work. But what he means basically is that your character is defined by what they do, not what they say. And this is also interesting because it's a pretty good life principle too, right? Like we are defined by what we do, not what we say. So no matter what I say on this podcast, it's what I do that's going to matter about like who I am and what I, how I reflect my messages out into the world. And I think that that's just a good principle to to live by when, when you're when you're writing a story. And but on a sentence by sentence level, it also could be observed as show don't tell. And in the book, I use a simple example of there's a difference between the sentence he was shocked, his jaw dropped. One is way more telling than the other. We, we all know this. Um, he was shocked is telling. His jaw dropped is showing. How much showing is infused in your story? That's going to depend on who your reader is, how much you care, how much, what style or genre. It depends on so many varying factors. But I do think it's a good principle to always remember that action and showing is the foundation for the story, the character, what's happening. It's not what you're saying. And, and, and people can get in trouble with this with dialogue a lot, right? Because dialogue could take the place of actual things happening in the plot. When it's like, yeah. what is happening in the plot is what matters. Are we moving along? What actions are happening? How are we showing that? And I think that that's what that imitation of action represents. Mm -hmm. I wish I could remember where I heard this so I could credit it appropriately, but somebody was talking about the idea that, oh, I think it was Tiffany Yates Martin in her intuitive editing book. And she said, she was talking about showing and telling and saying that most of the time showing is a good guideline, but there are sometimes when telling it is needed for that particular part, portion of the story. And the example she used was in The Princess Bride when all the allies come together and, they, and one of them says, like, what's been happening? And he said, oh, well, this happened. No, no, that will take too long. And, and he just, like, bangs through the three things that, that this character knows, but that the reader kind of needs to be reminded of. And it's, it's both a very funny line and also a very effective and economical way to accomplish what was needed there. But that popped into my head when you were talking about showing and telling. So I, th I think... I, and I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but I think that one of, you mentioned The Princess Bride, films are a great, great reference for novelists because they're so lean in their structure that they do not allow for all these extraneous things that all of a novelists, myself included, want to drone on about and go off on these different beaten paths. And if you watch how a story is structured and the reason why they're structured that way and the reason why they're so essential is because the cost is so much higher for a film to be made. So they have to make everything. It has to be tied so strictly to the through line and the central storyline. And so when you're looking at these principles, let's say, they're all going to be in these movies and these shows and they're going to be illuminated to a much brighter light than when you're reading novels. But then when you go into the novel, you're going to see it like that because 
it's in your head. But it's, it's, what does the protagonist want? What stands in the way of getting it? What are the internal and external obstacles? Like the first, the first thing that you see when you watch a movie is the protagonist and them wanting something. And then you learn in the next scene what's standing in their way of getting it. Now, it's all hidden in art, but that's in it almost every time. And so these are like good examples of transferring, watching movies and these principles and learning from them, like you, like the Princess Bride example, and then seeing it in your favorite novel or your favorite audio book or what, what have you. Yeah, I think you mentioned in, I'm cribbing a lot from Books for Men about Mystic River and how both the book and the film, I think you appreciated equally, but that it was a good example of something that takes Dennis Lane 40 pages to do in the book. It happens in a minute in the movie and that they're both affected in their own medium. Absolutely. And I, and I actually talk about that in Aristotle for Novelists a little bit as well, because I think Mystic River is a great example of what a film to novel could be. So if you love reading, as I do, everyone always ranks on the films. They say, oh, the, the film is, it doesn't compare to the novel. But the reality is, is that films have to strip down a novel. They can't tell the novel. And what they strip down, and if they're doing it well, is they strip down to the essence of the story, the essential nature of the story. And Mystic River is an excellent, excellent example of that. As you, as you just alluded to, Dennis Lehane, it takes him 40 to 50 pages to show what Clint Eastwood does in two minutes. And it's literally this, you get all the same information that you need. And it's not an indictment on Lehane. It's just showing you how lean a, a movie actually is compared to, and when it's done well, it's amazing. And it, 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 another thing that that movie does extremely well is there's an idea that Aristotle talks about in Poetics about recognitions and recognitions are when in, when a character recognizes something based on a sign or a plot event, which is normally, you know, what he recommends is the best way. And a character then acts either knowingly or unknowingly. And when they act knowingly versus unknowingly, we look at that character differently. And if you look through, as you writing your own novel, looking at your characters, what are they doing in your novel? And do they know this information or do they not know this information? And how do, is there any last minute reversals that you can infuse? It's hard to do. I'm not saying this is easy stuff to do, but this stuff is baked into stories, the DNA of stories on the page and screen. Yeah, I love those books that had that reversal. The, the other book that it makes me think of is Shutter Island. We don't want to give away a spoiler for that one, but those, those are both very well handled, I think. Okay. Both reversals. They're, they're both Lahane. That's, the, 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 Dennis Lahane is a, is a really, really good storyteller. He, he, he handles plot extremely, extremely well, in my opinion. So one of the other things I had selected was principle eight, which is novels should contain reversals and recognitions. But I think we've kind of covered now, right? Is there anything you'd like to add about recognitions? Yes. So a reversal and a recognition is simple as a reversal is a reversal of fortune. A recognition is going from ignorance to knowledge. So the best way that you could check your work for that is looking for things like therefore, so this happens, therefore this happens. Or this happens, but this happens. But would be a reversal. If you watch television shows and you watch movies, they can't survive without the but. The entire television show, no matter what it is, if you turn it on the tube tonight, it's but this, but this, but this, but this, but this. And those are all just little reversals. You think you're getting somewhere? but this happens. You think you're getting somewhere, but this happens until they provide resolution. Books aren't necessarily like that, but it's a good idea to see what a reversal is in action when it, and you could do that by just flipping on the, the television because it's literally how sh television shows are created. But in a macro sense, Aristotle says, so to write an Aristotelian plot, you need, you need three components. 
You need a change in fortune in your protagonist and you need a continuous connected series of events. But what makes it an Aristotelian plot is that A is a result of B. So the change of for fortune comes at the expense of the connected, uh, the connected sequence of events. And to go from a simple plot to a complex plot, the story needs a reversal. That's what makes it complex. So it needs a point where you're working up to something and then you reverse the reader expectations at a certain point before the change in fortune occurs. That's what makes it a complex Aristotelian plot in a traditional sense. But if we're talking about it in more literal terms, it's just what I was saying before, buts and therefores, either on a sentence by sentence or scene by scene level or extended out in the macro on a story level. And this, you might see a big difference in this with genre fiction, literary fiction, how they handle this is different. The style is different, but it's there. It's just sometimes more subtle. If, you, if, you, if we're adhering to Aristotelian principles, this is a direct quote from Aristotelian idea. A plot problem sh should come from the story itself. Like a, sol like a solving a plot problem should come from the story itself. So anytime, so even a reversal or anything of that nature should come from the story itself. But I, when I was talking about one thing being reflective of the other, I'm just talking about a Aristotelian plot. And so an Aristotelian plot, you have the change in fortune. So you have a character that go, it gets, he gets better or he gets worse. Does he, oh, does he or she overcome her flaws, internal, internal and external opposition and end up better off or a tragedy? Do they succumb to those flaws and external and internal opposition and end up worse off, right? That would be the difference between a tragedy and a comedy. And that change should be reflected in this sequence of events in your story. Got so it. that change has to be reflective of that. The reversal happens independent of that based on the sequence of events that you are on, you know, on, however you get to that point. That, that connection of change in fortune and your sequence of events and the change of fortune coming from, whether it's good, better off, or worse off, has to come from your, and almost all movies adhere to this, like almost all. D drama is very, very tight to Aristotelian principles. They, they use Aristotelian principles pretty, pretty tightly as, to tell their stories. Well, the reversal or the the ending situation tying to the chain of events, what it made me think of is it wouldn't work if Romeo and Juliet died in a sudden flood, but it's perfectly okay for Jack to die at the end of Titanic because of a water related incident because one is intrinsic to the to the plot, the other is not intrinsic to the plot. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. The whole thing with all tragedies, Romeo and Juliet included, is that why they and why Aristotle says they think they work is because they provide catharsis for the audience. So you know something is wrong and you want to see that truth unveiled, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so we know that this can't work out this way. And so we have this cathartic experience when we see the truth unveiled and all tragedies, the protagonist doesn't end up better off but what we do get is this bigger truth that's revealed to us about life, right? Mm -hmm. And so in Romeo and Juliet, it's passionate, passionate love doesn't last, right? Like that is the truth that's unveiled by the end. And everybody in life knows that already. Like we know that as consumers of the art, we, we don't need the story to tell us that. We just want to see it reflected by the end. Because we know it's true. This can't last. This doesn't work. <laughs> That's okay. Well, I'm going to combine two of the principles into one question. And they are principles nine and 10, which are novels should be logical and novels should be believable. So talk a little bit about what Aristotle has to say about those principles. Right. So logic and believability, again, to me, are, are essential, obviously, 
That's why <laughs> they're principles. But logic refers mostly to the idea of chain of causality. And chain of causality is the idea that everything is consequential in your novel. So everything happens via cause and effect. This happens, and because this happens, then this happens. Then this happens. It's not and, and this, and this. It's this happens, therefore this happens, therefore this happens. It's consequential. It's via, it's via cause and effect. And Aristotle is very is insistent about everything having that essential connection component to it. In fact, that is what that second half of a working plot is, a continuous connected series of events. It's not events that aren't connected because if they're not connected, they could just be coincidence. They're not linked by cause and effect. And if they're coincidence, they're not as effective, right? So it's it's having an entrenched element of cause and effect in your novel. That is what means it's logical. It's like, okay, this makes sense because this just happened. It's not like this comes in out of nowhere. In the book, in Poetics, he's very insistent on, and this is, comes to more of like a solution standpoint, like providing solutions to pro plot problems in your story. Avoid deus ex machina, which is when something comes out of the story to solve a particular pro plot problem. That not only violates logic, but it violates another principle, which is stories should be cohesive, right? Because it's not cohesive if things are coming from the outside of the story to solve particular you know, problems. All of this lack of cohesion, lack of logic affects believability. And if there's one thing that I've learned, not just from Aristotle, but from music, from films, from reading literature, if you don't believe it, that's not a good thing. Like the biggest, the biggest fault that you could fall into as a writer is thinking that unbelievable is a good thing for your story. Unbelievable is not a good thing. <laughs> Everything in your story needs to be believable. Everything. And that doesn't mean you have to write realistic fiction. It means that based on the world that you have created, it needs to be believable in the eyes of your reader. What that character says, what that character does, what that bit of dialogue sounds like, what happens next. Believability is the core ingredient to a working story. It's when I read a book or watch a movie, or listen to a piece of music. There's two questions that I ask myself. Do I want more of it? And do I believe it? And if I don't believe it, I'm definitely not going to want more of it. But the more of it is an aesthetic question. That's like a subjective question. So is believability. But believability really there is are things like things coming from outside of your story, or I'm just not buying what you're selling me. Those are questions that for me are ever present. I'm not saying they have to be ever present for the reader, for anybody, but if you are writing a story, believability is essential. A Aristotle talks about in the poetics, he constantly says things like, based on what's needed or likely, based on what's probable or necessary. Using words like that, meaning once we've dictated what the story is and who these characters are, going back to what we were talking about before with Fight Club and people pushing certain things onto characters and stories and trying to insert themselves into the narrative, not allowing characters to be true, which is another principle. You are violating believability and you see lashback because of that. And it's not as entertaining to the reader because we don't believe that these characters would do this in this situation. We don't believe that these characters would say that, would act that way. And the whole thing with Aristotle is the character should do what is likely or needed, probable or necessary. It's not unbelievable. Readers already, we're already, and I'm only speaking as a reader here, we're already constructing every possible scenario in our head. The best writing advice that I've ever received didn't come from a novelist at all. It came from a filmmaker. And they said, your job is only to write what's logically supposed to happen next. That's it. 
what is supposed to happen next? That is what you write. And if you're listening to the story and the character, you're going to know. You only get in trouble when you allow other things to come in from the, from the outside to affect how that character should act, what that character should say, what should happen in that story. I'm sorry, because I'm ranting a little bit here, no. but this is kind of gets, you're getting at the, the, like the core essential element of what makes uh, a, 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 a really good story, at least in my opinion. Yeah. Well, and evidently you have a good backup in Aristotle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yes. Um, uh, Doug, thank you so much. I love the conversation about Aristotle for novelists. And I think you, you've piqued our curiosity now. And hopefully I've also piqued listeners' curiosity about yeah. books for men. Check it out, even if, even if you're not a man. So, Doug, please let everybody know where they can go to find out more about you and your books and podcasts and everything else you do online. Yes, thank you so much. I appreciate you having me again. And if anyone wants to find out more information about myself, they can go to douglasvigliati.com. And if they want to find out more information about the book, Super simple. You go to aristotlefornovelist.com. Also on aristotlefornovelist.com, there is a 10 question assessment that one might want to take that would be able to help them determine if, if Aristotle would approve of their story. And it's just 10 or it's basically just 10 yes or no questions that would indicate if your story was a working story based on Aristotelian principles. So great. So now you've given that given us a little homework too. So thanks so much. <laughs> it's been great talking with you. Thank you so much, Maddie. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Doug. If you take Doug's quiz at aristotlefornovelists.com, please let us know what you learned. There are several backlist episodes that explore lessons writers can learn from movies, including episode 53, What Authors Can Learn from TV and Movies with Tiffany Yates Martin, episode 128, Lessons from Filmmaking for the Indie Author with John Gaspard. And episode 180, the top six lessons novelists can learn from movies, again with John. Also, Doug graciously offered a copy of Aristotle for Novelists, as well as Aristotle's Poetics, to a listener of the Indie Author Podcast. So if you'd like to enter to win, just go to douglasvigliati.com forward slash the Indie Author. And that's Indie with a Y. And if you got value from this episode and were thinking, I wish I could buy Maddie a cup of coffee, you can do that. Scroll to the bottom of any page at theindieauthor.com and click Buy Me a Coffee. Until next time, here's wishing you favorable winds and smooth sailing on your creative voyage.